Hello, everyone, and welcome to another uh, faculty spotlight here at the Brown Center. Uh, today, we'll be having Dr. Mayhill Fowler uh, speaking on the trauma of untold stories, researching World War II era Ukrainian actresses during Russia's war in Ukraine today. Thank you, Dr. Mayhill Fowler, and you can begin. Okay, um, awesome. Uh, first of all, I just really want to thank um, Chris and Harry so much for organizing this series, and um, I want to thank Stetson for continuing the practice of supporting faculty research through summer grants. Um, so I, um, I shared some of my thoughts on how my teaching has changed since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in my presentation on Values Day um, with my colleagues Elena Kolopayeva and Anya Haleta, but here I really want to talk about um, research. And I wanted to do three things today. So first, explaining some of my positionality as a scholar of Ukraine. And second, talk about the way my book project has changed given new understandings of Soviet history um, since the full-scale invasion. And finally, share some of that thinking on the book project um, that I'm working on and talk kind of in detail about one particular chapter. And I'll just say right now, there's no PowerPoint. Um, this is really old school. Um, so you can totally, as you've done, like turn your video off, like relax. Um, I told Emily Mears, you can multitask. I won't take it personally. Um, but it's just really lovely to be able to get a chance to sort of share um, some of my thoughts on my field and on my work um, with, I have to say, a really wonderful um, collection of people here on this Zoom screen. And it really means a lot to me that you were all showed up and took time out of your busy schedules to um, listen to me kind of drone on. Um, for uh, for a little bit. And I'll also just highlight Carly Mahler, who's here, um, who's been in my Money Muse seminar and has heard a lot of these thoughts kind of scattered throughout the semester. So um, here you're hearing them all, all at once. So, so first of all, what happens when your field of research blows up? Um, our field, Russian, East European and Eurasian studies is really challenged right now, coping with um, one um, country of the field, um, uh, essentially trying to destroy um, another. And I wrote a piece about this with my colleague Sophia Diak this summer for our field newsletter, suggesting um, sort of some concrete ways to address the challenges that the field is facing right now. But for our purposes here, I just want to summarize and sort of address my sense over the past nine months that our field is still so deeply imbalanced and so Russia dominant. Um, the day after the invasion, I was actually at SCSS, which is the Southern Conference on Slavic Studies, and at the breakfast sort of before the panels begin, and I ran into um, a very good colleague, a great historian, really, really great Soviet historian, um, and he said, oh my God, it's so awful. What are we going to do about our Russian colleagues? And um, I do know where he was coming from. His career has unfolded in connection with Russian colleagues and Russian state institutions on, on history. Um, and of course, he's concerned about, about his friends and his career. Um, but I was really shocked. He actually knew I worked on Ukraine. And I was really shocked that his first thought was about Russia and not about our colleagues whose homes were being destroyed in Ukraine, um, whom Russia was trying to kill. Um, and whose lives were completely upended. Um, and that disconnect that I felt at that moment is really emblematic for me of something I've really kind of um, experienced over the past nine months, which is that there's this primary concern for Russia, actually, and less Ukraine. And let me explain that a little bit, right? Um, so I've been on about um, probably 30 panels since, since February. And if I'm the only Ukrainianist, the conversation always turns to Russia, um, not out of any kind of malice at all. It's just what people know. People know something about Russia. Um, people in the audience have read something about Russia. They know they've read something about Putin. So the questions kind of tend to turn the discussion um, towards Russia and Ukraine gets lost. And this has really highlighted to me how, um, how actually how behind we are in our field and how much, um, how deeply we need um, decolonization, which is a really big word. And there's a lot of um, actually really great people writing about decolonizing the field right now and sort of decolonizing um, Ukrainian studies. It's, it's a big word. It's sort of hard to know what to do with it. Um, but I think it's really about questioning our hierarchies and questioning center and periphery and sort of questioning what are our normative models um, and, and where we put our centers. Um, for a while, I was using this term de-imperialization and unwinding empire, which 
which didn't really take on. But I, but to me, it's very useful to think about the way in which um, somehow in our field, these models of empire are still very present. Um, and and the, there's still these very deeply held um, imperial attitudes towards the periphery, um, which is Ukraine. So even though people are against war, of course they are, right? Um, they still don't necessarily care about Ukraine or um, care about learning about Ukraine. And, and sometimes I've sensed this sort of um, among among colleagues on these panels, this sort of shock, like why is like why am I supposed to care about Ukraine right now? Like why is this small country, you know, suddenly something I was supposed to care about? Um, it's not a small country. It's super important. We've been saying that for years, right? But that knowledge has been lost. That knowledge has really been kind of vanished and pushed aside um, with imperial structures and knowledge production. And so, how do we break that imperial attitude? And I think the only answer is to continuing to present and continuing to publish. Um, and continuing to work, right? Um, but here we went into challenges of archival logistics and ethics in a time of war. So right now, people are paying researchers, so Western colleagues, Western scholars, are paying researchers in Russia to, to go to archives and get work for them. Um, there's one historian um, I know who recently went to archives in St. Petersburg and wrote about it extensively on, on Facebook and, and got a lot of pushback. Um, uh, you know, people saying you're literally contributing to, to the economy of, of Russia, which is committing war against Ukraine. So what are you doing? Um, but I think that that will continue. I think that people will continue figuring out ways to, to work archivally um, in, in Russia, which I think is morally questionable. Um, no one is going to archives in Ukraine. They're working 24 seven, actually, they're digitizing a ton of material. Um, unfortunately, nothing I need, um, more like 17th century metrical books with sort of births and deaths and, and everything. Um, and, it, and it is really important. Um, the um, one archive, the security services archive in Shivniki was actually bombed and that material was completely destroyed. It was a really important region and an important collection for a lot of reasons and it's just gone. Um, uh, and, and of course, there's much concern that these state archives, which are major objects, um, might be sort of targeted um, as well. Um, and, and even when um, archives are open to researchers, and they, they probably will be um, at some point, I'm not comfortable as an American taking up electricity and, and water and time for my own monograph um, that five people might read. Um, I don't. I don't know that that's a very good use of, of, um, of resources. There's so much to be done in this country. Um, it's given so much to me, and I think that sitting reading archival documents on theater is not the best way to give back. But this will change the field, right? There will continue to be a lot of books on Russia using archival sources, and I'm not quite sure what's happening to the field of Ukrainian studies. We've talked a lot about using different archives and diaspora archives, like the ones that I'll talk about um, uh, shortly in, in Cleveland, but that work is different, right? It's just kind of different sources and it makes you tell different stories. Um, and, and, and the work sort of requires a level of bandwidth that I, I, I may not have right now because of the pressure of doing activism scholarship um, and trying to make sure that this country exists in everyone's mental maps in the US, right? Which is sort of taking up most of my, of my mental space. So secondly, I wanna to touch briefly on my thoughts on, on Soviet history. Um, this is a very hard time to be a Soviet historian. Um, and I can, I can talk um, more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. So um, essentially since 2014, uh, when Russia occupied Crimea, but really since February, I think I would say that I've turned from being a Soviet historian, right? Someone who, who sort of defines herself as working primarily on the Soviet system um, as really being a scholar of place of Ukraine. Um, and not just as like one country, like I just studied this one country, but, but really thinking about Ukraine as this very interesting, rich, productive space that connects to larger questions and connects to larger themes and can really kind of help open windows um, on, on different fields. Um, and so my focus is more on place and less on kind of one political regime, if that makes sense. So let me explain that with the book project that I'm working on. So as um, I think most of you on this Zoom know, I have a dead project or rather a project that I don't know what to do with and I'm totally open to ideas. Um, 
I used to be working on this very cool book project about one of the seven military theaters in the USSR. Um, seven of the 16 military districts sponsored a theater that was run through the Ministry of Defense and not the Ministry of Culture, um, which is really cool for a lot of reasons because they're these kind of imperial institutions that are very Soviet, but also very, very local. And so they allow us to make new arguments about culture and politics in the USSR. Um, I did some really cool research actually on my, um, on my sabbatical. I like wormed my way into the Ministry of Defense archives in Kiev, which involved getting like the text SMS number of some like female high ranking officer and like texting her um, to try to to try to get access. Um, I met some amazing archivists there. I got access to this um, uncatalogued collection that that it was really luxury and I can tell it, but it's probably really boring. But but the point is, I got some great materials. I read really cool stuff, but um, one of the major characters in the book is the Soviet military. And it's really, um, the book looks at the Soviet military as um, a patron of the arts. And I'm just not sure kind of how to do that now um, because of this sort of vulgar continuity with the, with the Russian army. And I, and I kind of can't find it within myself um, to write this book. Um, and there've been some really interesting pieces on emotion in the researcher. It's something that um, kind of the, the embodiedness of research that um, scholars have work on, worked on. And there's an anthropologist, Dari Tsambaliuk, who wrote a piece in Nature this summer um, about kind of the, the emotion of the researcher and kind of listening to, to your body and that that is a way of kind of informing the work that you're doing. Um, and so for some reason, I just can't, I just don't know what to do with this, with this, um, with this project. Um, so I've been working on this book on women in a Ukrainian theater, and I actually sort of made that pivot earlier because um, when I was doing the research for the military theater book, COVID hit, and I stopped being able to do archival research, and I really need some more archival research for that project. So I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll just take a little break, and I'll do this book on women, which is really cool, and it's really interesting, and then when we're through COVID, you know, I'll go back to the, to the military project, but, um, but war has really um, kind of changed, changed my, my trajectory there. Um, and now I'm really trying to finish this book on women in theater um, as a way of, of promoting Ukraine, showing it exists in a time when Russia is trying to destroy it, um, when our field tends towards Russia. Um, and, I, and I think that there's um, a way in which, and I'm not alone in this, I have a lot of colleagues who feel this way, that there's sort of this um, educational and intellectual front of the war, right? That, you, that um, that to, to keep writing about Ukraine and to keep telling Ukraine is kind of a way of, um, of doing what we can. And so scholarship becomes more activism. And I think that that's actually something to discuss because I think it's a major problem. I actually don't think scholarship is activism. And the fact that I feel kind of this activist urge in my scholarship, um, I actually don't think it's great. Um, uh, so I can I can talk about that more. In any case, here's the book. Um, so it it's te technically right now called Comrade Actress. Soviet Ukrainian women on the stage and behind the scenes. It's a great title, I have to say, because the only play in the 1930s written and directed by women um, in Soviet Ukraine at the Berezil Theater, which is like this major theater, was called Comrade Woman. Um, so the title is a play on that, on that um, production. Um, but it's a little Soviet right now. And part of what happened to me over the summer, I think, is that I really switched the book from being a very Soviet book to actually really a book fully engaging in place and looking at women kind of in this um, in this place. This is a book about women in Ukrainian theater and women in theater in Ukraine. Um, and it really is about women. It's not really about um, gender because really for too long, um, the focus uh, in theater history in Ukraine has been on male leaders, on these sort of very famous guys who wrote these manifestos and plays and women have really been overlooked and that needs correcting. And this is really different from um, say theater history in France or theater history in Britain where there's a sort of long history of looking at gender, right? This is, this is not true um, here. And one of my arguments is that actually theater is a very masculine sphere um, in the Soviet Union and a, and a sphere where notions of what is masculine and what is feminine are being negotiated and, and transmitted to the public. Uh, but the book is really about people whose stories have not been told in the creation of theater. And it's also about Ukraine. And it's very much about the ways that place is specific and the ways that external factors such as war and occupation 
Um, this is a place that had occupation in World War I and World War II. Um, and multiple empires shaped lives here in ways that lives just were not shaped elsewhere. So it's part of the Russian and the Habsburg Empire, Soviet Union and Poland, um, but also it's a space kind of between all of those um, regimes. So I'm really interested in the book about how space shapes people and, and kind of space as a category. And that people lived here, right, in this region that is Ukraine, shaped their lives um, in, in ways that their lives would have would have been shaped differently if they lived somewhere else, right? Um, and I should just say that the subjects in my book um, are all from this region, but some of them are Jewish and some of them are Ukrainian. Um, some of them might even be Polish. Um, so they really represent the multi-ethnicity of the region. And part of what makes this region specific is violence. Um, collapse of empires, war, occupation, violence of loss and trauma, um, and also I think the violence of archival silences. And so the 20th century played out here in a way that it simply did not elsewhere. On the borderlands in this region, we see the contingency, for example, of the Soviet project and the way that it only emerged through violence. So let me just go through a little bit about how the book has changed. Um, and I, I don't mean that it's you know, sort of completely changed in this like huge overhaul. Um, uh, you know, I'm not at a university where I could sort of take all this time off to like investigate sort of other archives really, but um, but I think I'm highlighting slightly different features and kind of putting a slightly different focuses um, in the chapters such that it is, it is more about, about um, kind of Ukraine broadly conceptualized. So my introduction was really focused on um, this 19th century diva Maria Zankovetska, who's like super cool. Um, and she's part of the professionalization of theater in the Russian empire, great. But she and her colleagues also traveled and toured to the Habsburg empire. To Galicia, right? So they're they're really touring across these two empires, and um, I think there's a way to talk about sort of minority language culture in this imperial space again, broadly conceived, and not just focusing um, on the on the Russian Empire. Um, chapter one is about the years of war and revolution when empires collapsed, and we see this sort of sudden, very exciting um, innovation in theater, which I which I wrote a book about um, several years ago. And my argument in this chapter actually is that. The real revolution is not aesthetic, which is what primarily theater scholars have written about, um, but professional. And that the real innovation was women who had been relegated to sort of amateur roles, or if you're a professional theater, you're a little bit dubious because there's sort of a prostitute air about you, right? Um, but actually really being able to enter the profession because of this overwhelming expansion of state-sponsored um, theater, th state-sponsored theater institutes, puppet theaters, theaters for kids. Um, and those are theater positions that haven't really attracted a lot of scholarship. Um, they haven't been considered as kind of like innovative and sexy. Um, and those are often where women work. It's often the women who are running the theater institutes or women who are running these puppet theaters or making puppets um, and theaters for kids. So actually when you start looking more broadly at this, at this um, expanding Soviet theatrical landscape, you see women all over right, um, in a way that you really don't um, in the pre-Soviet period. And I'm focusing on two particular women from Habsburg, Galicia, who end up coming to Soviet Ukraine. And by to focusing on their biographies, I'm able to show sort of what's different in the Soviet Union than, for example, in Poland. And chapter two, I'm arguing about the conservatism of the avant-garde, that regardless of the creative innovations and general coolness of the art in, in Kharkiv in the 1920s, women's stories still remained untold because they were not in leadership um, positions. Um, and this is actually very consonant with, with a lot of, of um, Europe, in particular, actually Eastern Europe. Um, there's a lot of very cool women in Polish cabaret, for example, but they're not actually running the cabarets. They're really dependent on kind of male patrons um, to, to advance their um, careers. Um, so the issue is just that the USSR was sort of claiming to sort of recreate the world in all these different ways. Um, and, and they did theatrically, but not in sort of putting women in leadership roles. So chapter three, I was working on this summer and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but it's about trauma and experience as a factor shaping culture in this region. Um, I'm looking at these two actresses from Galicia actually and um, tracing one of them who journeys to the Gulag and back and one of them to evacuation um, and back, and that kind of allows me to focus on the experience of, of war in this place, which was evacuation and occupation, um, and obviously deep, um, deep trauma. 
Um, I gave a talk last year on part of this actually um, during the faculty research event at the Board of Trustees Alumni Weekend Homecoming President Inauguration event. So um, you might be able to find that somewhere. Um, chapters four and five, I haven't totally figured out um, what to do with them. One of them is about um, diva activists in the post-war years when being an actress really came with a lot of responsibility in the theater workers union and sort of helping people sort housing, for example, sort pensions, um, sort medical care. Um, and one is about late Soviet women in, in state theaters kind of negotiating um, hierarchies of power. My final chapter is about the years after the Soviet collapse and the rise of women involved in theater in independent Ukraine. And part of that is just explained by the fact that like, as soon as you have capitalism and jobs in finance, cultural jobs become low paying and then you have women doing them. Um, but still there's really interesting reasons actually for this influx of women in leadership positions in theater. I actually wrote an article about this um, earlier this year um, if, you're, if you're interested. So the book has sort of changed. It's still very much about, it's still very much coming from a Soviet historian, um, but it's expanded just a little bit to really include more of, of Ukraine and what I worked on this summer was this chapter on the trauma of return, actresses on the wartime and post-war Ukrainian stage. And what was really interesting to me, um, given the war and watching kind of my friends go through the war, was the missing aspects of the materials that I had. And so I'm gonna talk about this a little bit, sort of absences in, in archival sources. For example, there's missing children. So if we start with the memoir of theater actress, Sofia Fedorceva, um, she's a major actress in the Brazil theater, which is sort of the major theater in Soviet Ukraine. And she was on the last group of her theater's actors to leave Kharkiv, Soviet Ukraine. So this is the former capital of Soviet Ukraine. She's in a major state theater. The Soviet um, state basically had these evacuation trains for people who could get the tickets, right? And anyone employed in a state theater got a ticket on an evacuation train to take them to Central Asia, okay? Um, away from, from the front lines because the, the German army was advancing. And not everyone was able to evacuate. Um, Fedorceva shares that there's another actor, Mikhailo Pocatello, whose wife can't travel since she'd literally just given birth and was lying in the hospital. And Fedorceva's memoir like never returns to what happens to these people who are left behind. Once evacuated, she does morale building broadcasts on the radio for anyone in occupied Ukraine um, who needs to hear them and can get the radio frequency. When she glances over the text and reads the word Ukraine, she becomes very emotional. And she writes, Ukraine, where is it? Where is my native Soviet Ukraine? It is ruined. It is plundered by the enemies. There in Ukraine remains my child. There are my relatives. In 1943, when artists learn that Kharkiv has been liberated and everyone celebrates, she notes that she can now go home to Kharkiv, to my native Ukraine, and I can seek out my daughter in Lviv. So in the space of a few pages, she mentions her daughter twice. Later, she explains that she'd left her daughter with her sister, Maria, who was a Polish opera singer, in Lviv before the war. And when this before is remains unclear, actually. Um, this is a Soviet era memoir. So I think she means before the war as in um, before the Nazis invaded breaking the Hitler-Stalin pact in 1939. This is of note. In other words, the Soviets occupied Poland, right? Um, the Soviets and the Nazis um, divided Poland and the Hitler-Stalin pact in fall 1939. Um, September 1st, the Nazis came in. September 17th, the Soviets came in. So the Soviets occupied um, this region that is today Western Ukraine, was then Eastern Poland, where the city of Lviv is. Um, the Soviets occupied Lviv. Um, so for everyone in Poland, the war started in 1939. Um, but I think she means the war starting in 1941. Like all actors, she would have been going on summer tour with her theater, and she most likely left her daughter with her sister in Lviv, which was now part of Soviet Ukraine, um, before she went on summer tour. And this is actually very common um, that actors sort of were on tour in the summer of 1941, and then their family remained 
um, uh, under, under Nazi occupation. And the war indeed did shatter families. People were deported, they were murdered, they escaped. People made choices to stay, to leave, to go east, to stay with the Soviet Union, to stay under German occupation. And those choices had consequences, operating, separating families, often forever. So this actress is just one among many, right, who's separated from her children, but as public persona actresses didn't speak of personal distress. But the missing children's story is never told. We never learn about her daughter, Vladzinka, how she and her sister Maria survived under Nazi occupation in Lviv, which is very brutal. Fedorseva later accounts how she's at a party at Khrushchev's dacha outside Kyiv after the city has been liberated, but before the war was over. Khrushchev was a Soviet leader, right, who would be general secretary after Stalin's, um, after Stalin's death, long story. Anyways, um, Fedorzev is at this party and this hack but famous playwright, Alexander Korinchuk, notes that she seems sad, but says, well, soon Lviv will be ours, and Sonichko, our Sofia Fedorzeva, can search out her daughter. So clearly most people knew that her daughter was in Lviv, although that hasn't reached the archival record, um, and it's also very interesting that he says, soon Lviv will be ours. Like Lviv had never really been theirs, right? Except when they occupied it in 1939. So it's very interesting kind of the, the, the mental maps, right? Of the Soviet um, elite at that time. So thanks to a special pass from Kornichuk, Fedorzev is able to fly in a military plane, literally like just as the city is, is liberated before the war has been won, she's able to fly in a military plane to find her daughter. And she goes to the apartment where her sister lives and she's describing this. Um, and no one's there, but the neighbors assure her that like everyone's okay. And then her sister comes up um, and Fedorseva says, and where is my daughter? Skriknula ya. I cried out. And her sister replies, no, 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 she's fine. It's just, she was scared during the bombing. So it was better for her to stay in the village. And so Fedorseva writes that she's found out that her child is well. She says, my child was well and healthy, but she remained separated from me. And so with that, I returned to Kharkiv. So it's very interesting. She goes through this whole story of wanting to find her daughter, this kind of incredible story of you know, meeting this guy at the party who has the ticket for the plane. Um, but then once there in Soviet, in, 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 in the moment where she's supposed to meet her daughter, she can't and she doesn't stay, right? She, she has to leave right away. She never gets that reunion with her daughter. Instead though, in her memoir, she describes how she returns to work and talks about her work on a poem called Mother of Soldiers that she then presented a lot at, at, at concerts. And she talks about this poem and how well received it was and how much the soldiers loved it. And the poem has these lines. There are no letters from you, oh my son. My love for you, my son. Today, they are sending you into battle. And so it's a poem about the sort of loss of connection with a son. Um, and she's using this to connect with the audience. And of course, it's literally on the next page of her memoir. Um, and there must be this connection with, with her daughter. And so it's not that there's not emotion in her memoirs. She describes, for example, coming back to Kharkiv and um, how emotional it is to see the city ruined um, after, after the war. But that emotion is very safe, right? It's the emotion of love towards a city, towards a place, towards the motherland, not the distress of not knowing where your child is um, under, under occupation. There are also people who remain unknown, not only children. And other memoirs can kind of help us investigate these blank spots and highlight others. So at the same time as Fedorseva is playing her last shows before evacuation, another actor shows up. And his name is Josip Pirniak. And he comes back to this, um, the same theater where Fedorseva works, um, and he's rejoining the same theater from which he was arrested in 1934. So he spent five years in the Gulag. Um, and so he has a very different point of view um, about um, coming back to Soviet theater. And he actually doesn't go on the train to Central Asia. He has a ticket. He doesn't go. Um, and he's clearly looking for a way out of the Soviet space. And of all people, he and his wife, Olympia, stay with Mikhailo Pukotilo's wife and baby. Remember, Pocotillo had left, his wife was in the hospital. So from this memoir, we get that she has left the hospital with the child. She's living in the apartment of a Jewish actor who had evacuated on a Soviet train. And so the Hirnyaks stay with Pocotillo's wife, whom they never name, and the baby. Um, and eventually, um, 
you know, when the when the Soviets, they learned the Soviets have left the city, right, and the Germans have taken over. Um, and ultimately, the Hirniaks escape through um, Nazi occupation um, to the city of Lviv, which is under um, Nazi occupation. Um, and Hirniak says, the Second World War was my life raft. I grabbed onto it. I swam on the chaotic waves in the reverse direction, right? So the Second World War is a life raft for him. They go to Lviv. He's actually from that region originally. He's from the Habs Habsburg Galicia. They meet up with another former Soviet actor, Volodymyr Blavatsky, and they do the first ever Hamlet in Ukrainian in Lviv, in the opera theater under Nazi occupation, a stone's throw, I mean, really a three minute walk away from the Jewish ghetto where a third of the city's population was murdered in the Holocaust. So let's return to Pogatilo's wife who was never named. In fact, Pogatilo never returned to his nameless wife or child. In the early days of bombing Kharkiv, another actress, Polina Kupcharanko, lost her husband. She was devastated, but she continued working. She evacuated with the theater. And during the war, she and Pocotelo get together and they spend the rest of their lives together, although Pocotelo's wife refused to give him um, a divorce, um, sort of somewhat understandably, one might say. Um, so who is P Pocotelo's wife? And by the way, if you Google like Mikhailo Pocotelo and Polina Kupcharanko, like, you can find all these sort of amazing love stories. Um, but the wife remains a blank spot. In fact, I have not been able to even find her name. Um, and this sort of easy narrative of, of evacuation and falling in love doing frontline theater obscures the reality of the wife not only left behind, but abandoned. And we never learn what happened to the child. And surely Pocatillo's wife has her own war story. And I think this multiplicity of voices is necessary to paint a picture of war because most texts do kind of skim the surface of ugliness, of emotional choices, the contingency of war. Um, while Fedorceva's memoir account suggests a one-way dynamic, like there's no other choices, um, barely lingering on those who left um, stayed behind, assuming this kind of teleology of Soviet victory, Hirniak's memoir adds the chaos of war. And so the line separating these two fates, those who go east, those who go west, actually was not so clear. And in fact, I think surely Fedorceva was worried about her daughter when she was evacuating, and she could have made a similar choice as Hirniak. She could have said, I'm not going to go on the train. I'm going to go back to Poland. I'm going to find my daughter. Um, but she didn't. And so on the one hand, I think war makes choices seem really clear, right? Um, but then these personal moments, I think, show how it's anything but. And read in context, Hirniak's and Fedorceva's memoirs mirror each other, right? Hirniak's memoir is written in the United States in immigration by a former resident of the Gulag, no friend to the Soviet system. Um, but Fedorceva's memoir is written at the end of a life lived in the Soviet century. But the two together create a picture. We see Soviet actors wavering in Hirniak's story. We see Fedorceva unable to talk about her daughter, but spending quite a long time on this poem about a lost son. And we see Pocatillo's wife lose her husband, but we never learn her name. And part of my work this summer was putting together these disparate patchy, sketchy, absence-filled stories to piece together this landscape of war, a landscape that is not just Soviet, but more about this place, Ukraine. So in my story previously, in my work on this project, the Hidniaks kind of faded away. Um, you know, once they, once they sort of leave the Soviet zone, um, they kind of dropped out of my project. But in a Diaspora Museum archive in Cleveland this summer, I actually found the programs and the tickets for that Hamlet, um, which is really, really um, interesting. Um, I read short articles about their work in DP, displaced persons camps in the allied zone in Austria after the war. So I now sort of take them in my book, sort of um, I spend more time on this period under occupation and take them um, into Philadelphia. Interestingly, his wife Olympia still remains a little bit um, in the shadows, but I'm working to bring her out. In the archives, I found other women, um, uh, one very interesting memoir testimony of this woman who was an amateur Ukrainian actress in interwar Poland and then with her husband worked under Nazi occupation in this sort of very prestigious theater um, and then ended up in the in the American DP camps and then in Ohio. Um, and then one very interesting woman who had these sort of um, amazing photos of herself doing amateur theater in Poland and then herself in the DP camps and she seems to have sort of dropped out of theater 
um, when she emigrated to the United States. But um, I'm really interested in this greater landscape of war and occupation and the ways that choices shape personal and professional trajectories. And I'm in interested in these lives under occupation as in evacuation. And I'm really interested in the ways that we see all these crisscrossing. So I'll just give one more example of this. Um, in a biography of a star actress at the military theater, actually, so this is this project kind of rearing its head, um, Zinaida Diktaryova is her name. Um, her biographer simply says about her time in the war, she says, well, you know, her mother died um, when the war began and life was hard. And then she just says this sentence, Konchilos Djetstva, her childhood end. Um, but the experiences that made her childhood end are never detailed, right? We just kind of skip um, to the next piece. Um, but she studied theater after the war in Odessa, and she joined actually the Lviv Operetta. Um, and she moved to Lviv. And one of the people running this theater was this poet, writer, Mikhail Rodnitsky, um, as well as several Jews who are part of this theater after the closure of Yiddish theater throughout the Soviet Union. So. Um, Long story, Yiddish theater was closed throughout the Soviet Union. And because Lviv was a newly Soviet city and had a lot of job positions open, essentially, a lot of these actors were sort of relocated um, to the city of Lviv. And Drudnitsky, who's involved in this Lviv operetta, where Zinaida Diktoryova gets a job, um, was the translator for that Shakespeare Hamlet. So he was the translator for Hamlet, directed by Josip Irniak, that was performed at the Lviv Opera Theater under Nazi occupation in 1942. Because of that, ultimately, he was accused of collaboration, thrown out of the Writers' Union, and he eventually committed suicide. Also performing at the Operetta Theater with Zinaida Diktoryova was Anna Scheinfeld, who'd also been in the Yiddish theater as a star actress, um, and she got transferred here. Her family was all murdered in the Holocaust, but she survived, and she ended up later in the puppet theater in Lviv. So I'm really interested in these sort of interlocking stories of performance and survival and trauma. And what I'm really interested in is how trauma shapes performance, but I'll probably never know that um, because I lack the sources. But we do see here the way that experience shapes place. While everyone in Eastern Europe and the USSR experienced World War II, of course they did. The experiences in Ukraine are slightly different. Here there were more partisans, here there was more nationalism or nationalisms of many violent forms. Here there is occupation. Here there was ambivalence. Here there was return from exile or evacuation to ruin. Here was frontline violence touching everyone. And this meant that post-war repair was different actually. And I'll add in a postscript, and this is the final thing that I'm saying, and then we can, we can um, chat a bit more, is that um, I'm very aware of the way that the current war has its own silences and stories untold. For all that we know so much because of social media and big data, we know so little. And as I'm working on actors under Nazi occupation by choice or by contingency, many actors now in Ukraine are under Russian occupation and their stories seem unbearably complex. So just for an example, the Mykola Kulish Theater in Kherson, which is performing right now under Russian occupation, but their Facebook page is managed by the displaced members of the theater, not under occupation. And they had this post that, um, 23 members of their company had stayed under the Russians and they, um, managers of the Facebook page sort of talk about how painful it is that these people that they'd worked with um, shoulder to shoulder for years had, had sort of betrayed them, right? Um, and um, everyone who, who got out of Kherson has these sort of um, incredible stories of getting out of the city. So obviously there's a lot of trauma involved um, in getting out of the city and sort of reflecting on what's happening to their company. Um, under Russian occupation. And there's a sort of story of how a lot of the people who stayed had what was called zvania or titles, like people's artist. Um, it used to be people's artist of the, Soviet, of the Soviet Union, now it's people's artist of Ukraine. And, and so the, the displaced members of the company want to get those titles removed. And it turns out there's interestingly no legal way to do it. There's no way to sort of remove um, titles from an artist that already has one. And after World War II, those who collaborated by performing under the Nazis were often tried and sent to the Gulag or just sent to the Gulag. And so what will be the story of these artists once Kherson is liberated, once Ukraine is liberated? Um, I think that's a really complicated and difficult story, kind of what's gonna happen after the war. 
Going back further to 2014, the Donetsk Music and Drama Theater is still operating. There are even a few actors who have been named People's Artists of the Dayaner of the Donetsk People's Republic, and their website lauds the fact that they were able to perform in Mariupol for the first time in eight years. So eight years ago, indeed, Mariupol fiercely resisted um, Russian occupation and they remained Ukrainian, um, actually. And now, as, as you all, I'm sure, know from the news, right, Mariupol is very much destroyed. But this theater from the Dayanar is performing there, went there to perform, thankfully not in the theater bombed by the, by the Russian military, but in a different cultural center. But their stories, too, are stories of war, right? And um, my book was on the theater of the Carpathian military district, right? Um, long since separated from military management. But there is also a Black Sea Fleet theater in Crimea and Sevastopol that is still in operation, serving the troops in Russian occupied Crimea, right? They're serving the Russian army. Um, I used to be able to access their website and now I can't. Um, so I used to be able to sort of see what they were performing and, and now, now I cannot. In any case, all of this informs my view of the past and the past my view of the present. And there's no way for it not to be so. As historians, we laud ob objectivity. We let the sources speak. But of course, our emotions, our circumstances, our world today shapes what questions we ask of our sources and how we hear the answers to those questions. And I see now how this current phase of the war throws the past in a whole new light for me. I think of those actors under Nazi occupation when I really only thought of those in evacuation. I think of the Poles who could not believe that Lviv would not return to Poland when I previously largely focused only on the Ukrainians moving into the city after the war. I think of the actresses missing children or who lost their entire families or who survived the Holocaust themselves, like Dina Pruncheva, one of the few survivors of Babin Yar, um, the uh, pit in Kiev where, where the Nazis um, murdered 33,000 Jews in two days in September 1941 and continued to kind of murder people um, throughout the war. Dina Polonicheva is one of the few survivors. Um, and then after the war, she returned to her job in a Kiev puppet theater, which incidentally in a few years took up a space of a, of a synagogue in Kiev. Um, I think of the trauma as I sort of um, stand on one shore as I watch my second home and my friends who live there experiencing something I will never actually really understand. I wish I could walk this walk with them, but I'm safe here in this world where war is really, really far away. And I think my job is to fight that sense of paralysis and that sense of guilt and keep talking and keep writing and one day soon, hopefully return to Ukraine to cross that river of trauma, to witness the recovery and reconstruction after victory. So um, thank you so much for, for hanging in there for 43 minutes of talk. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And um, I'm, I'm really um, you know, open to any questions that anyone has. Hey, Mayhill. Hi, Martin. Hey, uh, well, it's great to hear you this morning. And you know, as somebody else who also writes about Ukraine under occupation after the war, I mean, obviously the last uh, six, seven months, you know, we, uh, I began to look again at what I wrote and, and begin to, you know, think about how, uh, how so much more complicated things are actually when you're living through something than, than it, than they are when you're writing about it from 50 years, sure. uh, 60 or 70 years afterwards. But I, I, I just have a ton of things to say. I, I just, uh, you know, just the thing that hit me was uh, earlier on when you were uh, just getting into your conversation there about about the book and the first chapter. There was something in there about uh, about people, uh, uh, Ukrainians uh, who left Galicia, left uh, what had been the Habsburg Empire. And it was, of course, uh, obviously uh, in flux at that moment, but they left that space and they found li living in Soviet Ukraine, the new one to be more preferable than living in uh, the, 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 new, the new Poland. Poland, yeah. Right, so I, 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 so I, I don't know, could you, could you, I think that's a great example of, of the choices that people were were faced with as as borders moved back and forth here, the fact that these um, Ukrainian uh, theater professionals would 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 prefer living in the Soviet Union of the twenties than they would living in the 
in the new independent Poland uh, of the 1920s. It, it shows you, uh, I think, uh, I think it, you know, it, when we think think about this mo this moment when Poland and Ukraine are such good friends right now. Exactly, right? but they were not. But, but but yet, I think everybody in the audience needs to recognize that for a very long while, Poland and Ukrainian Poles and Ukrainians have not been friends, and it's yeah. only. But I think everybody also needs to remember that there's been incredible changes, very quick changes. Uh, that um, I know people right now in our field like to think that obviously that uh, many that Ukraine has a, a long history of national coming togetherness that it's been going on for a long while. I think that events have have moved so quickly here over the last six, seven months that I, I, I do think that the trauma uh, involved with Putin's um, invasion has brought Ukrainians, you know, they were already coming together and now they've been, they've been brought together much, things have been sped up and aggressively moved along, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that I, I, that's just a couple of comments that I have out here. So really good, look forward to it coming out and um but could you speak to those two yeah those two yeah Ukrainians so, who decided? yeah so first of all i think that the um the issue um and certainly i feel this with you of sort of rethinking um rethinking what i published right and um and it's really it's really hard um as some of you know um i've been working on a ukrainian translation of my book well there is a ukraine there's a beautiful ukrainian translation of my book um but it has not come out and i've been sort of stuck in Copy edits, I actually don't know if it's ever going to come out. I think the copy editor um, is sort of mad at me um, because part of the argument of the book is that they were Soviet artists, right? And trying to put them in this larger Soviet structure. And that's not an argument that goes over really well right now, even though I think it's important. And so, um, and, and as I sort of look back on like some of the copy editors, Yarin It's Simple, who's really, really great, but some of her comments, I'm like, wow, like I never meant it like that. I am like super pro-Ukrainian, like I love Ukraine, but I can see how that, the way that I put that um, now seems a little, now should be rephrased, right? And so that so that rethinking of your work is, is really interesting. And I do think that there's a way in which, um, I've been thinking a lot about um, how uh, in my sort of cohort of, of Soviet historians, there was this, this kind of like, not soft peddling the Soviet system, but also like, at all, but like kind of um, uh, I guess I was always very careful to sort of put my people in this Soviet context and maybe in a certain sense ignored some of the epistemic violence or some of the the violence that wasn't just shooting people in the back of the head, but like some of the other violence involved in uh, culture in empire, right? And and I think that um uh, I am rethinking some of my work. I still stand by it, but it's a very weird thing to go back over your book and be like, oh, I would have said that differently, right? Um, but your question about um, about the Galician is really, really interesting. So, um, so both of them, these two women, ended up in Soviet Ukraine kind of by contingency. Yes, by choice, because they were following Les Kudabas, who was like a really big deal, and like the best of the best. Um, but also, yeah, it was like really hard to do Ukrainian theater in Poland. Poland really struggled with its minority policies. We know a lot about anti-Semitism, but also there was anti-Ukrainianism, right? And Fedorceva's husband was actually a really big Ukrainian activist and he lost his job and he was really sick. So she actually went to the Soviet Union because she was going to get a paycheck. And the idea was like she'd, she'd get, like she'd support her family. Um, but then she died and she brought her daughter over and then, and then you're kind of there. But what's interesting too is that they all have family in Poland that remain in Poland. And so um, one of the sections of this chapter actually is Polish sisters, because all of them have Polish sisters, which sort of drop out of the archival record and out of their memoirs. And, you know, again, in a, in a perfect world, if there weren't a war going on, I would go track down the Polish sisters, right? Um, because of course, they, they leave a lot of Habsburg traces, right? They leave family in, in Habsburg, Galicia, they speak Polish, right? They have that connection. Um, and I think focusing on these biographies really allows for highlighting the circulation that shapes this region so much. So thank you so much for those comments, Martin. Um, Emily. Hey, that was really great, Mayhill. Thank you. It's like all so interesting. And um, 
Yeah. So one of the things I was interested in is when you were talking about, you know, the multiplicity of stories and how you are, um, you know, trying to bring these different stories together. I, I was thinking about um, how maybe there are some challenges in doing that in traditional sort of typical forms of historical narrative. So yeah. I wondered, you know, and I was sort of interested in how you were approaching this problem, you know, as a as a writer. And so I was wondering if if that's something you've thought about too, like, does it require kind of writing the history differently, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's like a great question. And I um I was actually just talking with a colleague um a couple of weeks ago, you know, who was kind of like, uh, oh, you know, you have tenure, like just forget it, just write historical fiction, you know, write something <laughs> fun, you know. Um, and 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 I sort of had this moment, you know, maybe it was the glass of wine. I was like, yeah, so I'm totally gonna do that. Um I think that it is a very difficult position to be in to try to write about personal lives of people in the Soviet Union when we don't have a lot of sources, when people were very reticent to talk about their inner lives. Yeah. And inner life probably meant something very different. Um, and um, I don't, and I sort of don't know what to do with these absences. And so right. I wrote this one article where I tried to be like really sort of sexy methodological about that, you know, like when we don't have our sources, like, what do we do, you know? Um, but the reality is you've got to write a book and I don't want to read a book about absences. I want to read a book about people. And um, so yeah. I sort of don't know how to do that. And I um, I don't know how to do that. And I think in, if I had more bandwidth and I had more energy, like I had this moment this summer, um, maybe halfway through. So I was like over a little bit of the trauma of this spring semester. Um, and, and I just started writing about Sofia Fedorseva and she has this very evocative story of coming back to Kharkiv after the war. And it's like, so, it's like so similar to today. It's just scary, mm -hmm. but I was like writing and it was like really interesting and it was sort of coming to me. Um, but then that kind of ended and I had to prep for the semester and I haven't had that sort of wave of energy mm -hmm. of creativity of creativity since then. And so part of it is I think I need a more creative solution to tell this story with all these absences. Right. And I don't feel like I have that creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's also interesting. And yeah, and I, I think, you know, the space to, to write and find yeah. those approaches is so important too. And yeah, I'll, I'll just add it. I think, you know, it's like in history, we're always trying to, you know, find the narrative and yeah. you know, find arguments and follow the story through yeah. from beginning to end. But in a way you've got these stories that have these threads that, you know, get lost, which kind of is the story in, in some way, I know. right? I think so, that is the story. I think that yeah. is the story. I mean, I think these sort of connections, like the thing I was talking about, this guy, Mikhail Rudnitsky, who translates the Hamlet, who's at this theater with these people. Yeah. And there's sort of more of that, of, of there's sort of more of that and um so I do think that is I do think that that piecing that together is the story um and I think part of the part of the part of what I feel I'm learning is that this sounds so banal but war is really complicated and there isn't like one story exactly yeah. and and so that kind of has to be in there um as well. So yeah, I think I'm struggling a bit with genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, hi, Martin. Yeah. No, I, I'm sorry. I don't want to monopolize. No, you. it's totally fine. You were, you were, you just, when you, you know, finish that last phrase that you're saying that you know, one thing you're, I'm, I'm learning that is that war is so complicated, right? Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, it seems like a lot of the book is is really sort of focuses. Uh, I mean, like World War World War Two would be the would be the sort of like apex of it all, right? I mean, kind of things go up and they kind of go yeah. down, right? Is that? Yeah. Um, but you were saying earlier in your comments about something about how you thought a lot of your colleagues have been had been soft peddling the Soviet system. Well, I feel like I have been soft peddling. All right. Well, I, I, I'm not saying you were. I didn't. Think, I don't think you were at all because I mean, you do. Well, think, look at all that you're doing right now with this text, for example. I mean, Thank the question, you. I think the bigger picture that everybody out here who's listening uh, needs to recognize is that, you know, is that is that not that many people really in our field these recently in these days and years and decades has really been studying the wars, right? Yeah. I mean, like, 
you'd be surprised. I mean, <laughs> maybe Chris, I know you're a veteran out there, but I mean, when it comes to World War One, when it comes to the Civil War, when it comes to World War Two, Afghanistan, Chechnya, these are, these are, um, you, you go, there aren't that many panels about those types of things, uh, believe it or not, right? I mean, I mean, maybe that's a little bit of an extreme statement, but I mean, what we've all learned is that an awful lot goes on on a daily basis. And we're absolutely tired out and completely exhausted by all of this, yeah. by the different fronts. And you I mean, think about how many military historians we have in our field. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot, there's a lot we can say about that, right? Just, you know, we could list them on one hand here uh, in yeah. the United States of America. So, uh, you know, I, I do think that we, have, have have recognized that a lot is happening on a, that is shaping uh, the futures and how we ever how is this space ever going to come back together again it, it seems really really hard really really difficult for that ever to occur here and now and yet of course what we're talking about is a, a space that was brought back together you know um through violence and through force right yeah i mean i think that's the issue right that so first of all, it, it really occurred to me this summer how so much of the story I told in my book and that I was really interested in the avant-garde of the 1920s was after the war, right? Like these were people who survived World War I and they really did, like they were under occupation. You know what I mean? Like they were actually, a lot of them were under Russian occupation in, in Ternopil, right, in Lviv. Um, so they survived World War I um, and they were in this region, right, where like there's this for people who don't know, there was like a Polish Bolshevik war, like honestly, like places in this region, as, as Martin knows, like it's amazing anyone survived, right? You have sort of these front lines going back and forth. So these people survived this, and then they got to build this whole new world, right? And that's where sort of the 1920s comes from here. Um, and then they go through World War II, right? So it is this kind of like this, this occupation and war, like really, really shaping, um, really shaping their, their lives. Um, and to Chris's comment, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And what's interesting is um, there's some really interesting veteran organizations in Ukraine that have been operating since 2014, right? Since the war started, there's some amazing, um, there's an organization called Invisible Battalion that's about women and working with women, um, people working with PTSD. There's a, um, so there's a lot, but I think the challenge is gonna be, um, and there's so many people getting testimony, right? After getting testimony from people who've been fighting in the war after regions are liberated from the Russians, like getting, getting testimony. Um, but my colleague Sophia brought up this, this Sophia Diak from the Center for Urban History in Lviv brought up this point that no one is taking oral histories yet of people who really have lived and collaborated with the Russian regime, right? Like, it's one thing to have been Bucha or the suburbs, the wealthy suburbs outside Kiev, which were sort of under occupation for a short amount of time. We heard about Izum, right? Um, and we heard about sort of the, the crimes of the, of the Russian occupying army. But of course, for places like Kherson, um, for places to survive under Russian occupation for a long time, obviously people are working with the regime. They are. And so who's getting that testimony? And the people from the from the testimony from people who survived under occupation, and how do they kind of justify that to themselves? And then how does Ukraine, after the war, God willing, to, to right, um, put bring these people back together? Um, and I think that's really difficult. And um, and what do you do with collaborators? And and like Martin, to refer to your comment, like the Soviet Union did a terrible job with it, right? I mean, you know. Uh, 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 you know, there was sort of no um, mercy and um, the way that the Soviets dealt with it was very, very violent. And so what, how will Ukraine deal with it? I don't, I don't know. And I think that's really a, a challenge. I think um, my colleague, Francisca Exler, who wrote this great book on Belarus and coming to terms with the war and post-war Belarus, looked a lot at the ways that international justice systems help and the ways that kind of using legal regimes helps helps people come to terms with the war. So maybe that's an avenue that we can see some sort of um, moving forward, being able to, to follow trials that are internationally recognized and that kind of lead to a sense of, of working through what happened. But um, in my work on culture, you, you see the kind of the dregs of that, like you see um, 
you see the way that people on an everyday level are working through this stuff in the stories that they're telling in novels or in films. And I think that um, I'm, I'm deeply worried about what will happen after the war. Anyways, Kimberly, your hand was up. I'm so sorry. I was droning on. Well, it was, but we're out of time now. So I can just have a comment, a conversation with you later on. Okay. We can stay for two more minutes if it's short. We still have 10 more minutes. Ah, okay. Well, what I was going to comment on is that the kind of work that you and Martin were talking about has leaked into my own, um, my, my own uh, time period in that since we've had the various uh, instances of occupation, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, now Russia, you're seeing in popular culture, uh, the kind of post-colonial theory that uh, has been um, dealt with by scholars for quite a few years now in the occupation of Britain under the Romans. Mm. And we don't have the testimonies that you have. We right. have fragmentary right. inscriptions. Every once right. in a while, a woman might be mentioned. Right. So we've made it up. It is historical right. fiction. But right. the interesting thing is that we are yeah. juxtapositioning our post-colonial occupation experiences in yeah. places like Russia coming into Ukraine or right. going into Afghanistan or into Iraq and putting it into this uh, turn of the millennium culture in yeah. such a way that if you watch this, this terrible pop culture fiction of Britannia right. and the rest, right, you right. would feel like you are watching um, a, a fictionalized account of what it's like to live in uh, this post-occupation scenario. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's interesting. This and a lot of these discussions on decolonization and and sort of deimperialization and postcoloniality, uh, which are really important conversations, and I think conversations we need to be having. Um, and I think there's some awareness of you know when what is our discourse and what is the discourse of our historical subjects, right? So we're not just like rolling a theory over, you know, hook, line, and sinker, but we're actually thinking about what are the ways in which people understood um, their world, right? And the, the ways in which they understood their world and kind of using these lenses to try to do that as opposed to just kind of, you know, uh, rolling the theory over. But I think there's, there's really interesting um, uh, conversations happening in the field right now, um, but it is really hard. And it is this sort of pressure of activism and of kind of continual engagement and, and deep concern Right, I think makes it a little hard to have the mental space and capacity to do the deep thinking that our kind of that our work um, requires. So, are there any last questions? Um, I know you guys have stayed on um, and held in there um, for a long time. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, on, a, on just a final note, our field conference um, is this week, the Association of Slavic East European and Eurasian Studies in Chicago. And actually I proposed a, a paper, I was invited on a panel and proposed the paper like in January. So before the full scale invasion and it's on, um, it's on this military theater. So sort of over the last couple of weeks, I've had to actually go back to those notes. And it's really interesting how rereading those notes from that military theater project um, in light of, of the war today, the phase of the war today is is sort of changing some of my thoughts on that. And, um, you know, maybe I'll figure out a way to make that project work. But in the meantime, hopefully I'll be able to finish this book on actresses and, and go from there. But I really appreciate all of you being here and listening to my work. Thank you so, so much. And thank you to Chris for manning, for manning from behind the scenes. <laughs>